Hello there, I'm author Kate Messner. Happy World Read Aloud Day. I am so excited to be celebrating with you and with some author friends. In this video, you will hear from a dozen authors reading their work aloud. You'll hear from some brand new books and from some books that aren't even out yet. You'll get a sneak preview. In this video, you'll hear from Renee Watson, Anne Ursu, Meg Medina, Tracy Batiste, Linda Urban, and Hannah Khan, Olubemi Sola Rude Perkovic, Ellen O, Dawn Quigley, Debbie Michiko Florence, and Rajani Laraka. I'm going to get us started with a read aloud from my History Smashers series. This is a brand new illustrated graphic nonfiction series from Random House, illustrated by Dylan McConus, and it's all about unraveling the myths we sometimes learn about history. The first three books are out now. They're History Smashers, The Mayflower, Women's Right to Vote, and Pearl Harbor. This is the book I'm going to read to you a little bit from today. And I'm gonna start by reading the introduction. You've probably heard the phrase, remember Pearl Harbor. The Japanese military attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, is one of the most infamous events in American history. Maybe you've heard stories about that day, how the attack was a total surprise with no warning whatsoever, how it lit up the morning sky on December 7, 1941, devastated the American fleet in the Pacific, and created immediate support for the United States to jump into World War II. But only parts of that story are true. When we look closely at documents from that time period, other parts come crashing down. Here's the real deal about the not such a total surprise attack that eventually led the United States into its second world war, along with some important, but not so well-known stories about what happened next. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you a little bit of Dylan's amazing art as we read about the bombing of the USS Arizona. USS Arizona survivor, Jim Miller, was in one of the ship's turrets when the early bombs hit. There was a tremendous shaking, he said. He wasn't hurt though, so he stepped out of the turret to see what was happening. The forward part of the ship was just solid flame. He saw burned and bleeding men on the deck and decided that his first priority was to help fight the fire. Other men joined in too. It looked like a blowtorch coming out of the hole where the bomb went in, said USS Arizona survivor Glenn Lane. He grabbed a hose and tried to help, but there was no water pressure. So we just got a few drops coming out of that stupid hose. The flames were already out of control. Sailors did the best they could to help their injured friends on deck and rescue those who were trapped in the smoke and fumes in compartments below. All the while, Japanese gunners were shooting at them from above. The next bomb, a 1,760 pound armor piercing shell dropped from a high altitude Japanese plane. It was devastating. It blasted through the USS Arizona's forward magazine where the gunpowder was kept. Glenn Lane felt the whole ship raise out of the water just like a bucking bronco. He dropped his fire hose and braced himself. I turned my back as quick as I could and that concussion and fireball hit like we opened a furnace door. The explosion blasted Lane right off the ship and into the sea. Other men found themselves surrounded by flames on the deck. Some escaped by crossing hand over hand on a line tossed over from the vessel. It was a treacherous escape, swinging above the water with patches of oil burning below. Come on, one more swing, you can make it. Meanwhile, Glenn Lane fought his way to the surface of the oil covered sea. Lane burst above the waves and sucked in great breaths of air. I looked back. I couldn't see a living person on the ship, not one. So Lane started swimming for the USS Nevada. All around him, men struggled to survive. Finally, covered in slick black oil, Lane climbed up the gangway. He'd made it, but the trouble wasn't over yet. 
At about 8.45 that morning, there was a lull in the noise and chaos. The Japanese planes seemed to be gone, but what Lane and the other men didn't realize was that a second wave of planes was already on the way. So that is a little bit from the opening uh, and the middle of History Smashers Pearl Harbor. You can find this book and the other books in the History Smasher series right at your library or at your favorite bookstore. Are you ready for some more read alouds now? I'm gonna send it on to author Renee Watson. Happy World Read Aloud Day. Hi, my name is Renee Watson, and to celebrate World Read Aloud Day, I'll be reading a scene from my upcoming book, Ways to Grow Love. The thing about being a big sister. Nothing is the same. Now that mom is pregnant, everything has changed. Before school let out for summer, Miss Colby said to my class, have a great summer. I hope you have fun and that it's full of special moments. The way summer is going, I won't have any special moments because all the summer plans we made aren't happening. Well, they are happening, but not the way they're supposed to. Like today, mom promised to take me to the library so I can check out some of the books from the summer reading list that Miss Colby handed out on the last day of school. But now she can't take me because she has morning sickness, even though it's the afternoon. Grandma is on her way to pick me up. She said she doesn't have a lot of time, but she can squeeze it in if I promise to be quick. But who can be quick in a wonderland of words and pictures? It's not that I don't like spending time with grandma. It's just that mom and I go to the library at the end of every school year and we put, pick out books and have a book club, just the two of us. And every time we go to the library together, mom points out the books she loved when she was my age, and we always sit and start reading one of them before we leave. It's been a whole week and we haven't gone yet. Just when I was starting to get excited about having a little sister, she goes and ruins my summer plans. Everyone keeps telling me things will be different once the baby is here, but she's not even out of my mama's belly and already she's changed everything. The North Portland Library isn't crowded at all, and I feel bad for being in such a rush because there are plenty of books to choose from. So many, I have a hard time deciding which ones I want to take home first. Grandma says, just choose one, honey. You have all summer to come back and get more. It doesn't matter which one you read first. Grandma skims over the books on the shelf and says, how about this one? I don't even look it over. I just say yes, since Grandma is in such a rush. When we get to the counter, the librarian, Miss Adair, says, Only one today, Miss Ryan? Yeah, just one today, but I'll be back for more. I sure hope so. Wouldn't want you to miss out on the summer reading challenge. There's all kinds of prizes. Miss Adair hands me something that looks like the bingo sheets Grandma and her friends use when they have game night. Come on, Ryan, we got to get home, Grandma says. Thank you, Miss Adair. Anytime. On our way home, Grandma says, I know you're disappointed about not being able to stay longer, but this is all a part of being a big sister now. You're going to have to make some adjustments and sacrifices. I know. I know. When we get to my house, I step into the living room. The first thing Mom says is, what adventure are we going on? And she reaches for the book. Grandma only let me pick one, I tell her. Mom rubs her belly. We'll get more, sweetheart. We will. I hope so, because I want to win. I show mom the summer reading challenge bingo sheet. Mom smiles, and then she takes my hand and places it on her stomach. Every time you talk, the baby kicks. Really? I ask. Mom takes my hand and places it on her belly. And then I feel my baby sister waving hello. She's moving, she's moving. I know, mom says. She must like your voice. I sit on the sofa next to mom, tuck my feet under myself and get real close. My baby sister likes the sound of my voice. I don't know if I will ever stop smiling over this. The thing everyone tells me about being a big sister is that I'm going to have to share and sacrifice and help out more and live up to my name by being a leader and setting an example. 
but no one told me anything about how it would feel the first time I put my hand on my mom's belly and feel my sister waving hello. No one told me how it would feel to know that my baby sister already wants to play with me. I want to play with her too and hold her and teach her all the things I know. And so, even though she's the reason mom couldn't come with me to the library, and even though she's the reason so much is changing, changing, I snuggle up real close to mom, open my book and start reading out loud and take my mom and my baby sister on an adventure. This book is available April 27th and it's available now for pre-order. Hi, I'm Anne Ursu, and to celebrate World Read Aloud Day, I'm sharing a sneak preview of my upcoming book, The Troubled Girls of Dragomir Academy. Chapter One, The Girl in the Coop. There were few women pictured in the great tapestries of Illyria, besides the witches, of course. The, the tapestries depicted moments of heroism, epic battles of good and evil, of powerful sorcerers and brave noblemen protecting the kingdom from the monsters that had threatened it through its history. That is not to say that girls and women did not matter to Illyria. Behind every great tapestry was a woman who wove it, just as behind every great sorcerer was a wife to tend his domestic affairs, a governess to teach his children, a cook to warm his gullet, a maid to keep his fires lit. And behind every boy who dreamed of being a sorcerer was a mother who raised him to be brave, noble, and kind. And perhaps that boy even had a sister who, right before the Council for the Magical Protection of Illyria finally visited his humble home to test him for a magical gift, made sure the chicken coop was spotless. If some master weaver were to immortalize the scene at the Lupu house on the day the story begins, the day before the Council would come to find out if Luca Lupu was indeed a sorcerer, Maybe somewhere on the edges of the tapestry, you would find an image of his sister, Maria Lupu, doing just that. Why? Maria did not know. If you asked Maria, scrubbing out the chicken coop a second time this week was ridiculous. The council would be here to evaluate her brother, not the chicken coop. They would not look in the chicken coop, and even if for some reason they did look in the chicken coop and find it not to their naturally exalted chicken coop standards, it would hardly affect their evaluation of Luca but people never cared what Maria thought about such matters. It was hot and the coop was even more foul than usual. Maria's apron was filthy. There was something sticky woven into her long brown braids and feathers had taken up resonance in her mouth. Her nostrils tickled. A fly buzzed around her head in a manner that seemed deliberate. But this morning, Maria wasn't worried about stickiness, nostril tickling or deliberate flies because yesterday she had put honey in Luca's undergarments and today she could expect retribution. Why had she put honey in his undergarments? Two reasons. First, her older brother had spent his entire life being told by everyone that he had a great destiny. Someone had to put honey in his underwear. Second, he had started it. When Maria was nine, Luca had filled her boots with dung. She responded by making him oatmeal with sour goat milk, causing him to spend the entire night locked in the bathroom. Any normal person would have considered it done then, but Luca felt he had to get revenge on her, and so she had to pay him back, and on and on it had gone. And so this morning, when he appeared behind her as she was scrubbing some unspecified goo off the front of the coop, she jumped up and stood an arm's length away from him, just in case. Aren't you supposed to be studying, she asked. I told Papa I needed some fresh air for a moment, he said. There's fresh air over there, she said, pointing in the other direction. Ignoring her, he nodded toward the coop. That doesn't look very clean. Maybe you should use your magic, she said, crossing her arms. His eyes darkened. That's not funny. Just try, she said, before the council comes. Maybe it will work. That way, when they admire how clean the coop is, you can tell them you did it with magic. I don't have to prove myself to you. But you have to prove yourself to the council. What if they ask you to do something and you can't? That's not how it works, Luca said. You don't know that. I do know the council tests you before your magic comes in so an experienced sorcerer can mentor you through the process. They don't need to see magic, they can just tell. Maria pressed her lips together. She couldn't argue. After all, everything always worked out exactly the way Luca wanted, which was a kind of magic really. 
Anyway, he said, straightening, you better be nice to me for once. When they give me my own estate, I can just leave you here. I can order you to an asylum or banish you to Mootenland to be bait for the giants. That's all you care about, isn't it? Marius spat back. You just want to be rich and important. You want servants to boss around and do the work while you lie around wondering if your slippers are comfortable enough. Luca drew up. That's not what it's about. Being a sorcerer is a heavy responsibility. They need places to live and people to manage their affairs. I can't be worrying about the household when I'm supposed to be protecting the kingdom from the dread. The household, like it was already his, like he was already in his office at the center of some grand estate, giving orders, eating plums, letting someone else clean up the pits. It had not always been like this between them. There'd been a time when Mari and Luku shared a room and at night they'd lie in bed and whisper scary stories about giants and witches and dread, and then neither of them can sleep. There was a time when they played sorcerers in the backyard, waving their hands in the air and pretending to enchant the chickens. But that time was gone. Thank you so much. The book will come out in September. Hi everybody, it's Meg Medina and I am super excited to bring you the next installment of the Mercy Suarez saga. Out in April, Mercy Suarez can't dance. So here's a little piece of chapter one. I hope you like it. It was Miss McDaniel's idea for me and Wilson Bellevue to work together in the Ram Depot, a job nobody wants. For the record, I applied for an anchor spot on the morning announcements with my best friend Lena, but wouldn't you know it, Darris Ulmer's parents decided it was time to address his shyness issues, so he got the job instead. Anyway, when Miss McDaniels called Wilson and me to her office, neither one of us had any idea what she wanted, which should have been a big warning right there. We sat on the wooden bench near her desk at 8.15, sharp, just like her note said, since being late is the quickest way to get on her bad side. It's why some kids call her stopwatch behind her back. Talk about awkward. Wilson and I, I had nothing much to say as we waited. I only knew him from PE and earth science, the quiet kid with freckles across his nose and the reddish hair that he wears natural. I'd noticed his walk too. He swings one hip forward so his right leg can clear the ground. He says it doesn't hurt or anything. He was born that way. He told us last year during one of those annoying icebreaker activities that we're all subjected to on the first day of school. Anyway, we hadn't really talked much this year. The only other intel I had was that his family is Cajun and Creole from Louisiana. He told us that when he bought in gumbo to the One World Food Festival last year when we were in the sixth grade. It was pretty good, if you don't mind breaking into a full body sweat from spices. Miss McDaniels grabbed her key ring and made us follow her down the hall toward the cafeteria, our loafers squeaking in the quiet hall. A few minutes later, we stood in front of the Ram Depot, formerly known as the custodial supply closet before Mr. Vong and his equipment got upgraded to a bigger room near the gym. That's where she told us the big news. We'd been drafted. I think the two of you would make a fine management team at the school store, she said as she unlocked the door to the tiny space. A box of pencils labeled inventory was stacked against the wall near the dust bunnies. A metal cash box and a calculator sat on a cast off desk with uneven legs. You can hone your business and math skills right here and get real world experience. I try to keep my glare of death to a minimum level. First of all, if my business skills were any sharper, I'd have to register them as weapons. Thank you very much. Who does she think helps Poppy figure out job bids and write ad copy? Soul painting ink doesn't have five stars on Yelp for nothing. And as for Wilson, he was already a math whiz. I hear he computes circles around the other kids in the algebra class he takes with the ninth graders. But the bigger thing was how unfair this all was. 
Lena has morning announcements. Hannah was a assigned to be the supply aide in the cool maker space that's new this year. Me? I was facing a dungeon where fun goes to die and with a boy as my only company, no less. Wilson seemed just as appalled. Isn't there anything else, he asked? Maybe the Earth Club? I wouldn't mind rinsing out recyclables. I sneaked a glance at him secretly agreeing. Even washing out juice boxes and plastic snackable trays seemed better than this. What was there to do at the Ram Depot except, except sell pencils to kids who forgot theirs at home? She pursed her lips. I'm afraid not. Dr. Newman is very interested in improving the school store this year and I need especially strong student helpers for the task. She was buttering us up like biscuits. The question was, why? Hi, I'm Tracy Batiste. I am the author of African Icons, 10 People Who Built a Continent, which is coming out in the fall, October of 2021. It is a middle grade nonfiction book that uh, very much focuses on 10 people who were very important in, um, in African history, in leadership, in art, and, and so on. Um, and I'm going to be reading a very tiny section from the very first person mentioned, who is King Menes, who was the very first pharaoh of the Egyptian dynasties. So. Here we go. With his rule over the two lands firmly established, Menes needed to find a suitable place from which to rule. When he took the kingship, the capital of Upper Egypt, Abydos, lay far to the south, nowhere close to Lower Egypt. Menes needed to rule from somewhere more central to all his people. He decided to move the capital to a location at the border between the two regions. The move would further cement the two regions as one. But building the capital was no easy feat. One of the cataracts of the Nile ran right through what many thought was the ideal location, which made it waterlogged. To build a new capital there, many would have to literally move part of the Nile. The work of drying up part of the ri river was mathematically precise, meticulously managed, and brack-breakingly difficult. Under a hot Egyptian sun, hundreds of men, mostly farmers who were working in the months after harvest was done, labored to realize many's vision. They brought wood up from beyond the southern borders and the country of the neighboring kingdom, Kush. This was used to construct dams to, and reroute the river. Once the dams were in place and the river diverted, an island was created right in the center. Many's had the capital built on this island. The architecture of the new capital was incredible. Fortified buildings of solid brick, with three chambers stood overlooking the desert like sentinels. These whitewashed buildings would become a staple of Egyptian architecture and would later evolve into the many-chambered pyramids we all know well. It earned the city the name White Walls. Later, it would be renamed Memphis. The people of Egypt in their modest homes of mud brick, built to withstand the heat, and the nomadic people who traveled the dunes and spent their nights in tents on the sands of the Sahara, must have been struck with awe by the sight of the formidable buildings lining up in a row and reflecting the sunlight off their pristine walls like gold. One of the three original buildings at Memphis was set aside as Meni's palace. It was constructed as a rectangle on top of a rectangle reaching upwards like stairs into the sky, the realm of the god Horus. False doors of recessed rectangles decorated the outside walls and were painted brightly in red, yellow, black, blue, and green. All pigments available from plants and minerals in the land. The rectangle on top of rectangle design became the symbol of kingship. It was used on seals that would be stamped on doors and as decorations designed for members of the royal family and the high priests who served them. Just as Menes himself was the living embodiment of Horus on earth, the palace 
was the architectural representative of him to the people who weren't afforded the opportunity to see him beyond those gleaming white palace walls. So that is a little bit about Menes and some of the incredible things that he did to establish Egypt as the incredible um, place that it was, the with the an incredible government and incredible um, uh, infrastructure that just was not seen in the ancient world at that time. So um, I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Bye. Hey, hello, readers. I'm Linda Urban. I am the author of books like A Crooked Kind of Perfect, Hound Dog True, and The Center of Everything. Today, though, I'm going to read from you uh, from a new book. And I gotta tell you, almost nobody has heard this yet. So I wanted to share this selection of it just with you. So the book is called almost there and almost not. And it's about this girl, California Poppy, whose life till this point has been a little rough. And just recently, her father has left her with one aunt who left her with another that she doesn't even know um, in this house where there also happens to be a ghost lady. And this, can you see? What we're gonna read now is a short section. Um, it's, it's California's second meeting with dog. Um, and uh, the only other thing you need to know is that California's dad said that he was going up to Alaska for work when he left her. Okay, so here we go. The yard was dark but enough neighbors had porch lights on for me to see my way down the back steps and out to the cool grass. I wondered if it was dark in Alaska too, and if the grass there were cool or if there'd be snow on the ground, even though it was June. I was standing there wondering that when the little dog showed up again, this time so quiet, I didn't even notice until he was already lying at my feet, his little gaspy dog breath shuddering on my toes. Well, hey, dog, I said. I said it quiet so I wouldn't spook him. Dog wagged his tail and looked up at me like I was the best person he'd seen in forever. It's a nice thing being looked at like that. Could even make you cry if you were that kind of person. Mostly, though, it made me want to pet him. I wanted to scoop him up and hold him tight and pet him like Dorothy Gale does in does to her Toto when she finds him after her house crash. But instead, real slow, I put my hand out for sniffing again and made myself small as I could. Dog sniffed. Good dog, I said, real soft. Good dog, it's good to see you again. Saying stuff like that is how you make somebody feel welcome. Dog did feel welcome, I could tell. His tail wagged and he crawled himself closer. I put my other hand out for sniffing too and Dog kept on wagging. Could I pet you, Dog? I asked, would that be okay? Would it be okay if I pet you? Like I said, he can't talk and I didn't expect him to. But when he scooted even closer, I felt like he was saying, sure, we could try that, why not? I kept my left hand in sniffing range and slowly moved my right up over his pointy white ears. His eyes tracked me, but he didn't flinch. I'm not gonna hurt you, I said, and he knew I was telling him the truth. Slow and careful, I lowered my hand down gentle to ear level, but I didn't feel any ears or fur or any dog-like sensations. What I felt is something I'm still trying to find words for. Have you ever been in a car with the windows rolled down and you stick your hand out and you can feel the air rushing past and you push just a little against it and it feels almost solid and almost not? It felt like that. And you know how it is when the car stops and that feeling disappears on you? I mean, I couldn't help but be startled by an almost there dog. So I must have gasped or shouted or done something that scared him because he bolted, which 
is how I knew he was smart, that dog. Stepping away when somebody touches you wrong, that's smart. And I didn't blame him for it, even though I wished he was stayed. So that's just a couple of pages from Almost There and Almost Not. I hope if you've got a chance, you'll be interested in reading more. Happy World Read Aloud Day. I'm so glad to have shared this book with you. Have a great day. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Khan, and to celebrate World Read Aloud Day, I'll be offering a sneak preview from Amina's Song, my sequel to Amina's Voice, which comes out later this spring. And I hope that you'll enjoy. This is from the first chapter in which Amina is visiting her cousin Zora in Pakistan, and they're in a crowded market. Zora links her arm with mine and navigates through the crowds, warning me for the 17th time to watch my purse. I wouldn't be carrying a purse if I were wearing jeans, but I'm in a thin cotton shawar kameez that's more comfortable in the fierce summer heat. My hand is gripping the bag that's stuffed with the money I collected from generous relatives, excited to see me for the first time in eight years, and I try not to bump into people. Your friend will like those, Zora points with her eyebrows towards a stall filled with colorful lacquered boxes and figurines. They're made in Kashmir. They're pretty, I agree. Go see, but don't say anything. Once the shopkeeper hears your English, the price will triple. I wander over and pretend to admire a shawl when I notice a green and gold box with a curved lid. It's shaped like a little treasure chest and would be perfect for Su Jin. Then I spot some stunning jewelry in a glass case, including a silver necklace with a row of small cobalt blue stones. I try not to stare at it. Zora turns to the shopkeeper after I secretly signal what I want to her. Paisab, she beckons in Urdu, calling the man with the mustache and thick glasses, Mr. Brother, to be polite. Tell me the right price for this. No ripping me off. Her tone is surprisingly aggressive. Then Zora picks up a candle holder instead of the green box. When I start to protest, she gives me a death stare. I watch in silence as they haggle in Urdu over the price of something I don't want. Mr. Brother claims excellent quality. My cousin complains it's a robbery and says she isn't a fool. Then Zora suddenly drops the candle holder as if she's deeply offended by it and starts to walk away. Mustafa watches, his dark eyes amused, as Zora yanks my arm and starts to drag me off with her. Sister, see this, Mr. Brother offers when our backs are turned and we're almost in the next stall. I give you this for a good price. Zora turns around reluctantly. Don't waste our time. We're in a hurry. Come see. Very good price. Zora squeezes my arm and returns to the stall, acting like she's doing Mr. Brother a favor. He shows her some bowls and give her, gives her a number in rupees. I have no idea how much money that is, since my Urdu is especially terrible when it comes to numbers. Plus, I forget how to convert Pakistani currency into dollars. Zora shakes her head and then points toward the box I want. How about that? Can you live with it? She asks me, wrinkling her nose as if it's barely worth considering. I start to sweat. Am I supposed to say yes or no? I take a gamble and nod yes. Okay, final price. No game, Zora challenges the shopkeeper. The arguing continues until Mr. Brother finally gives Zora a number she grudgingly accepts. What color, she asks me. I point to the green box for Su Jin and a turquoise one for Emily. Zora adds another bright red one to the pile. From me to you, she says. What about that necklace? I whisper to Zora. She starts to shake her head, but Mr. Brother has superhuman hearing and whips the case open and hands me the necklace before she finishes. Very nice, he says in English. Zora gives me another glare, and Mustafa starts to chuckle. I giggle, too. There's no way Mr. Brother hasn't figured out we aren't from here, no matter how hard Zora tries to hide it. We've got American written all over us. Mustafa's t-shirt literally has the Captain America logo on it. It's very pretty, I say in my best Urdu, although I know my accent sounds pathetic. What are these stones? Lapis, Mr. Brother replies in English, beaming. Very real. Very cheap. Zora tries to convince me to walk away again, but I won't budge. Can you give me your best price, please? I imitate the Urdu phrase I've heard Zora use. Mr. Brother gives me a nod of acknowledgement, but then Zora takes over, speaking for me. My face burns. How am I supposed to get better at Urdu if no one lets me practice? I can't understand everything they're saying, but it's obvious Mr. Brother has the upper hand. After he names his final price, I pull out the wad of rupees from my purse, and Zora counts some and hands them over in defeat. She won't look at me, but I take the necklace and thank the man in Urdu, 
and he grins like he just won the lottery. Thanks for listening. This is Amina's Song, out March 9th, uh, available now for pre-order. And if you'd like a signed copy, I'll be offering those through my local indie, Politics and Prose. So I hope you'll check it out, and happy World Re Read Aloud Day. Thank you. Bye. Hi, I'm Olugbemi Sola Rude Perkovich, and to celebrate World Read Aloud Day, I'm going to share a sneak preview of my upcoming novel, It Doesn't Take a Genius. Chapter One. The last day of school is the perfect opportunity to make peace with Mac, or at least prompt him to rethink his plan to ride his bike past my house all summer, yelling, what you got, loser, the way he did last summer after I won the school debate trophy for the third straight year. Which, since I won that one, loser doesn't really make sense, but I guess yelling, what you got, winner, wouldn't either. I could have answered, well, I've got the trophies you wanted, even though you're older than me. But though I'm considered smart smart and not people smart, even I know that's probably not the way to go. Mac is pretty smart himself. We're both honor roll regulars. He's also a full-fledged, first-class, grade-A goon, even though he tries to disguise himself as an ordinary kid. One who's second best on the school debate team. I'm just saying. Anyway, he won this one, and let it never be said that Emmett Charles isn't a gentleman and a scholar. Congratulations, Mac. I say, holding my hand out, and up too, since my body hasn't gotten wise to the fact that I'm 13 now, and he's like NBA-sized. I try not to make a face, but the locker next to Max is giving off a smell that could destroy a nation. Shut it, tardigrade, mumbles Mac, shoving my hand away. He goes back to dumping what looks like 10 years worth of papers and books and maybe some fossilized sandwiches from his locker into his backpack. Interesting name calling, Mac. The water bear is definitely a resilient and minuscule animal, so nicely done. That might be a way to describe me, even though technically I didn't actually lose, so there's nothing for me to be resilient about. And anyway, I'm serious. Stellar job yesterday. I thought your argument in favor of corporal punishment at school was convincing, uh, mostly because of your enthusiasm for school-sanctioned beatdowns. I'm working hard not to inhale. Mac doesn't seem to notice that there might be a decomposing body tucked away right next to him. I probably should have stuck with just nice job because from the expression on his face and the way his fists clench, he doesn't need me to remind him that he didn't exactly beat me this year, that he's never beaten me, and he's tried to, a lot. That's a fact. My big brother Luke is always reminding me that sometimes the facts matter less than I think they do. You really are the dumbest smart guy around, aren't you? Asked Mac, slamming his locker door. I don't want your compliments. I don't want your attempts to be the bigger man, which is technically impossible. I don't want your anything. He walks away. Except maybe my three debate trophies. Also my science fair award, my spelling bee record. Little does he or anyone else know. I'd managed to avoid a catastrophe yesterday. Thanks so much for listening. It Doesn't Take a Genius is out on April 13th, and you can pre-order now. Happy World Read Aloud Day. Hi, I'm Ellen O, and I am here to celebrate World Read Aloud Day with you. So I'm sharing a sneak preview of my newest book, which is called Finding Junie Kim. See the cover? See? Isn't it beautiful? I love it. Um, so, I'm actually not going to read an excerpt, I'm going to read to you 
my dear reader letter, which is kind of um, a letter that talks about why it is that I wrote this book. Okay, so here goes. Dear reader, when I was young, my mom would always tell me the story about how she and her siblings were separated from their parents during the Korean War. Sometimes she would say they were lost for weeks, sometimes a month, sometimes it'd be raining in her story, and sometimes it was just really hot. But the premise always remained the same. Four little kids walking night and day on the roads of Korea, looking for their parents. I have to admit, it was always more of a tall tale. Uh, the long, difficult journey, the miraculous reunion, it was more of a family legend kind of like the magic fish story my father would tell me uh, about how our hot ancestors were turned into golden carp to save them from evil invaders. Yes, I was a ha before I became an o. Uh, or how my parents loved to tell me supposedly true, scary stories about evil Korean monsters who loved to eat naughty children named Ellen. So you can understand why I might have been a bit skeptical about the lost children's story. But then, I think nearly 10 years ago, my aunt came from South Korea to visit my mother in New York City, and after dinner, the two sisters became nostalgic. I listened in fascination as they reminisced about a memory that was 60 years old. My aunt, who is the eldest, would correct my mother's version of this epic story, and just like that, what had once been an unbelievable tale became a historical family truth. I suddenly realized that this miraculous journey was real and I was overwhelmed with a burning desire to write about it, to memorialize it. Now I began my own journey into researching the Korean War and it soon became very clear to me that I couldn't only write my mother's story. The subject matter was too complex, too emotional. And as I puzzled over this dilemma, I became aware of what was happening in my own community. You see, swastikas and racist graffiti were being found in schools all over my county, and my children were suffering. But how to tie this all into a story about the Korean War? Now, what I found myself doing was listening to my father's voice. You see, he passed away several years ago, but I, I still talk to him in my heart. I can hear him telling me his stories. I can hear his voice and his wise words that remind me of how important it is to pass on the stories of our elders so that we will always remember where we came from. And suddenly the story began to form. Without a doubt, this has been the hardest of my books to write, it's the most deeply personal. In many ways, I feel very exposed by what I share in this book, but I'm also proud of the story. It is both truth and fiction, historical and contemporary. It is my family story and the story of my motherland. Now, I hope that you will enjoy Junie's journey, and I thank you so much for reading. And so that is Junie, that is Finding Junie Kim. It is out on May 4th this year, and you can pre-order it now. So happy World Read Aloud Day. I hope you read a lot of books. Bye. Buju, I need everybody. Hi. My name is Dawn Quigley, and to celebrate World Read Aloud Day, I'm going to give you a sneak peek into my chapter in the anthology that's called Ancestor Approved. So remember, an anthology is a book with a lot of different stories in it, and so this is one of mine. And the really cool thing about this book is all of the authors are Native American people, and we all love to write for children. So. This is my story, and it's called Joey Reads the Sky. I'm just going to read an excerpt, or just a little bit. All right, Joey Reads the Sky by John Quigley. That's me. 
Um, also, I just want to let you know, my tribal nation that I'm from is the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. Joy reads the sky. Joey, pay attention to what you're doing, some people say. Joey, stop staring out the window, still others say. Every day, well, most days, I hear people yelling things like that to me. At school, at home, and even at my mom's world's best fry bread stand. Why would the fry bread stand be any different? Chop, chop, chop. That's my job at the fry bread stand. I don't get to make the dough or fry it. I don't get to take the customer orders. Don't even think I get to handle the money. I chop the fry bread topics. Lettuce, tomatoes, sometimes I get to grate the cheese. Yep, you could say I have the most important job, but then you'd be lying. Most weekend, it costs my mom a couple hundred dollars to rent the vendor space on the powwow trail for our table. But like I said, we're the world's best fry bread, so we usually make that money back within the first two hours. Joey, pay attention to what you're doing. Joey, stop staring out the window. My big brothers are always yelling at me like that, but I sort of lose track a lot of times, like when I'm looking out the window at the sky instead of working, which is why my brothers are yelling at me to get back to chopping again. They're not all bad, my big brothers. Liston, he's the oldest, will guff Makwa when he gets too rough with me. Makwa's only two years older than me, but at school he's always looking out for me. So they're okay. Just annoying most of the time. And usually I annoy Liston and Makwa. So we got to Ann Arbor, Michigan Thursday night and set up our food stand at the powwow. It wasn't too bad of a drive from Minneapolis, but spending over 10 hours in the car with my older brothers who love to eat nacho chip cheese and drink Mountain Dew, well, let's just say the gas from them probably helped fuel half the trip. We only hit some snow around Chicago, but you know, it's March in the Midwest, so it could be sunny and 70 here or slippery, snowy, and six below zero. Only the strong make it here, eh? The two things I love about road trips on the powwow trail are getting away from school for a few days, more on that next, and looking out my mom's old Chevy Equinox sunroof, more on that later. But most times my brother make me shut the sunroof shade. I want to look out and up, and they want a nap. They want it dark. Guess who wins? Yeah, getting out of school yesterday was awesome. It's not that I don't like school, it's that I hate it. I'm in the fourth grade at Four Winds Native American School, where my mom works as the lunch lady. My mom is raising me and my two older brothers alone after my dad died last year from cancer. My dad was really quiet, but he was our guiding star. Without him, we lost our way a bit. I think we'll always miss his way of showing us how to find where to go and how to get there. I know I will. So that's a little excerpt of the Powell Anthology, and it comes out February 9th. So I can't wait to see you all in person. Be safe, be well, and happy World Reading Day. Hi, I'm Debbie Michiko Florence, and to celebrate World Read Aloud Day, I'm sharing a special sneak preview of my upcoming novel, Just Be Cool, Jenna Sakai. Chapter one. Heartbreak is for suckers. Smart people protected their hearts and I wasn't stupid, far from it. I locked my heart in a vault and buried it where nobody could trample on it. Which is why even though Elliot Oxford dumped me right before Christmas break, my heart was still whole. Two weeks later, I made it through the entire first day back at school without any mention of Elliot. My best friend, Keiko Carter, hadn't brought him up once. She'd texted me while I was at my dad's in Texas for the holidays to see if I was okay, but I didn't answer. And after several long, meaningful looks from her at lunch, it looked like she'd taken the hint. Now, all I had to do was avoid Elliot at newspaper club. It wasn't as if we had to work together. Ignoring him was going to be a piece of cake. Unfortunately, I ran into Elliot on the way to my locker after school and I mean literally. 
I rounded a corner too quickly in my rush to get to Ms. Fontes's classroom, and Elliot and I crashed into each other. My messenger bag slipped off my shoulder and thudded to the ground. We both leaned down to reach for it at the same time and knocked heads. Ow! I straightened and rubbed my forehead. It was an accident, Elliot said, handing me my bag. I snatched it from him. He was the last person I wanted to talk to. His eyes traveled over me. You cut your hair and colored it. Way to state the obvious, I grumbled. I tugged the shorter turquoise strands. While I often dyed my hair when I was upset, this time I just wanted a fresh start. New year, new shade. Or at least that's what I told myself. Right. Elliot pressed his mouth into a straight line. I hefted my bag onto my shoulder as we stood there awkwardly. Are you heading to newspaper club? He asked. Why? Did you hope I'd drop it? Elliot frowned. I used to think that furrow between his eyebrows was cute. Not anymore. Why do you have to be so angry all the time? He asked. Why can't you stop judging people? It's not judgment. It's observation. A great journalist is a great observer. You should know that. Oh, he was going to go there again? A great journalist is also objective. Something you can't be if you're shooting angry flames out of your eyes all the time. That's physically impossible, I snapped. That's called a metaphor, Elliot said calmly. Gah, I hated when he got all condescending. I decided to skip my locker. I pivoted and stalked to newspaper club alone the way I liked it. This book comes out on August 3rd, 2021, and you can pre-order it anywhere you can buy books. If you pre-order it through my local independent bookstore, Bank Square Books, you'll be eligible to be entered in a grand prize drawing. More details will be available on my website very soon. Thank you and happy World Read Aloud Day. Hi, I'm Rajni Laraka, and to celebrate World Read Aloud Day, I'm sharing with you sneak previews of two of my forthcoming middle grade books. The first one is Red, White, and Hole, which comes out on February 2nd. Red, White, and Hole is a novel in verse set in 1983, and it's about Reha, the 13-year-old daughter of Indian immigrants who feels torn between the worlds of her parents and their Indian community and her school and 80s pop culture. Then she finds out that her mother is really sick and she feels torn in a completely different way. I'm gonna to read to you some of the poems from the very beginning of the book. Two, I have two lives, one that is Indian, one that is not. I have two best friends, one who is Indian, one who is not. At school, I swim in a river of white skin and blonde hair and brown hair and blue eyes and green eyes and hazel. School subjects and giggles about boys, salad and sandwiches. And on weekends, I float in a sea of brown skin and black hair and dark eyes, MTV music videos and giggles about boys, samosas and subjis. In both places, I have gossip and laughter, music and silence, friendship but only in one place do I have my parents. Give and take. I am Reha, born in a pool of my mother's blood, proper, prim, obediently alive as she lies close to death. Because you are here, I must stay, Amma whispers to me. To the Lord of death, she says, wait a while longer. To stay for me, she forfeits all future children, not just on her behalf, but daddy's as well. Just as she receives something precious, so much is taken from her. She says she never regretted it. Girls just want to have fun. That's what the song says, with the catchy melody that makes you sway back and forth. It's 1983. I'm 13. I just want to be like everyone else, to fit in, to have fun. I want to free my hair from this ponytail, this braid, toss it over my shoulders to unfurl in curly glory. I want to chew gum, 
wear cheap earrings, tight jeans, short skirts, roller skate, holding hands. I want to wear a drop waist dress to a dance. I want to have fun. We are different from Americans, whispers Amma's voice in my head. We work hard. We dress modestly. We focus on what is important to succeed. That is why we came to this country. And we won't waste our opportunity or change who we are. I listen to my mother. Always. But I am American. I was born here. It's the only home I know. So I'm caught between the life I want to lead and the one she thinks I should. First memory. I'm three years old, cradled in Amma's lap with daddy close by. We sit on the balcony of our apartment, looking at the night sky. Daddy takes my hand, points my finger at a silver globe. Moon, he says. That's what Amma is named for. Moon, I repeat. Amma takes my hand, points at tiny sparkles strewn like bright pebbles in the darkness. Star, she says. That's what Reha is named after. Star, I repeat. Which one? Amma holds my arms apart. All of them, Reha. And I embrace the field of light. I hope you enjoyed that excerpt. Red, White, and Whole is available on February 2nd, 2021, and you can order it today. And you can order signed personalized copies from Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you. And now I'm going to tell you about my second middle grade novel in 2021 called Much Ado About Baseball. Uh, it is a companion novel to my debut novel, Midsummer's Mayhem, which came out in 2019. Much Ado About Baseball is a dual point of view middle grade novel uh, told from the perspective of Trish and Ben, who are 12 year old math competition rivals who end up on the same summer baseball team. They can't stand each other at first and their team is awful, but then they find about, out about an interesting store where they sell snacks that seem to make people play sports better. And they each get a mysterious math booklet. When they start solving the puzzles, their team seems to win. So this is a story that set in the same town as Midsummer's Mayhem that combines math, baseball, snacks, and magic. I'm going to read for, to you from the first chapter. Chapter one, Trish. Baseball is magic. Baseball is magic. Time stops between the instant the ball is released and when it makes it over the plate, between the whack of the bat and when the ball finally touches earth again. And this summer, I was holding on to that magic for dear life. The threads tying me to everything important had snapped and I was a balloon floating, flying away on the breeze with nothing to tether me. I was in a new town, surrounded by new kids, yanked away from everyone who knew and accepted me. My brother Sanjay and I were playing catch on a stifling June afternoon in the backyard of our new home. You'll never be the strongest, so you need to play the smartest, he said as he threw me a scorcher. Sanjay's in high school, and he throws hard, but I got used to hand-stinging catches a long time ago. I'd already run my two miles and finished my push-ups and sit-ups for the day. Physically, I was ready. What if no one wants me on the team? I asked, tossing it back. I'd just left a town where the boys were used to seeing me on a baseball field, but I didn't know what to expect here. Sanjay caught the ball and laughed. You're a great teammate, not to mention an amazing ball player, he said. You hit, you run, you deserve a gold glove for fielding, and you, throw, you already throw four-seam and two-seam fastballs. If you can just make that circle change-up motion look exactly like your fastball, you'll be a hero. He tossed the ball high in the air, and I moved a few steps to get under it. Sanjay was my hero, and he believed in me, no matter what. The ball smacked into my glove. I'm just so... He waited for me to finish, but I didn't want to say the word out loud. Lost. I supposed I could always quit. That might make Mom happy, at least. Trish, Dad called from the garage. We need to leave now if you want to be early. I tossed the ball back to Sanjay and waved goodbye. Ready to meet your new team? Dad smiled and squeezed my shoulder, but that didn't stop my pulse from pounding in my throat. Yeah, I took a deep breath. I had to be the best. 
That's the only way I'd ever be accepted. So that was what I was going to do this summer. Thank you so much. I uh, hope you enjoyed that excerpt. And Much Ado About Baseball uh, is publishing on June 15th, and you can pre-order it now. Uh, and if you pre-order from the Silver Unicorn Bookstore in Acton, Massachusetts, you can get a signed and personalized copy. Happy World Read Aloud Day!